Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Political Quarterly Seminar. Uh, in just over three weeks, the Labour Party is going to be gathering in Brighton for the first face-to-face -face conference since Keir Starmer took over. Uh, and it's going to be a huge test, obviously, for him and for the party. And the question we're asking tonight is, does Keir Starmer have a plan? And more positively, what should his plan be? Uh, my name is Anna Killick, and uh, I'm the uh, one of the editors of the Politically, Political Quarterly Journal, so I'm going to be chairing this discussion. And just to introduce it very briefly, uh, this seminar comes out of a recent special section of the Political Quarterly Journal, which contains more than 10 excellent articles, not just on Starmerism, but also on Corbynism. Uh, and those articles are free to view on the Political Quarterly website, so um, do have a look at them. We've asked three of the authors to come here today to speak and to answer questions, and they are Jeremy Gilbert uh, at the University of East London, uh, Patrick Diamond, Associate Professor at Queen Mary's University of London, and Christine Berry, a freelance researcher and writer based in Manchester. Um, we're going to hear the speakers in that order. Jeremy and Patrick are going to focus on a sort of general picture of what Starmer's plan should be, and Christine more on Starmer's economic plan. Um, each of the speakers are going to speak for 13 minutes, and then there will be 45 minutes or more for your questions. Um, so I'll remind you at a point when um, you might want to start writing questions, and uh, that will be in chat. Um, and we'll be asking you, you know, just in the normal way to say what your name is uh, and write your question and who you're addressing your question to, whether to one of the speakers or all three. So we're going to start straight away. Uh, and um, I think probably the best order to give um, Jeremy a bit of time to gather himself, if it's all right to go Patrick, then Jeremy, then Christine. Um, so could we please um, start with Patrick and I'll give you a kind of minute warning um, just before the 13 minutes is up. Okay, thanks very much, Anna, and um, hello to everybody who's um, at the meeting this evening. Um, it's good to be with you and thanks to Political Quarterly and to Jeremy and Lewis for the invitation both to contribute to this special collection of articles, but also um, to speak and to contribute to tonight's session. So we've got a big question um, in front of us. Does Keir Starmer have a plan? And I guess that raises two issues. Does he have a plan, but also is it the right kind of plan to deliver the success um, that no doubt he and the Labour Party would like to see in the forthcoming period? I want to try to address this big question by considering three main points. The first is to consider what was the context, the legacy that Keir Starmer inherited when he became leader of the Labour Party in the spring of 2020. Um, we can talk about how Starmer has performed in the intervening period and we can consider the kind of plan that he's tried to develop, but we need to also, I think, reflect on what was his inheritance, what legacy was bequeathed to him when he became leader of the Labour Party um, just over 18 months ago. The second point I want to then consider is, given that inheritance, how effectively has Keir Starmer performed and is there real evidence of a plan emerging? And the third point I want to consider is if we would argue that Keir Starmer's leadership of the party has not yet delivered the kind of successful strategic approach that is necessary what could and should he now do to seek to improve Labour's position? So those are the three points I want to briefly consider in my opening remarks, and hopefully this will trigger some reflections, some questions, some, some thoughts from um, the audience. 
Okay, so to understand um, Keir Starmer's situation, to assess the state of the party he inherited in 2020, this, of course, is a is a big issue when we could cover uh, lots of different um, themes here. What I want to start by saying, though, is that Labour's problem is not just that it's lost four successive elections since 2010, but that it seems to have lost its overarching sense of purpose. There's a really sort of big looming issue across all of this, which is a, a very basic question about what is the Labour Party now for? What does it stand for? What does it exist to do? What, what is it trying to achieve? What are its aims and ambitions in society and the economy? And the problematic inheritance that Starmer has been bequeathed, I think, reflects a number of different factors. One of which, of course, is the problematic inheritance that was bequeathed by New Labour, um, which, of course, was the dominant force in the party from the mid-1990s through to that electoral defeat in 2010. As somebody who was involved in the New Labour project at the time, to some degree, one, I think, would have to accept that there are elements of that inheritance that have been problematic and that have meant that the party um, has struggled to identify the sense of purpose that I just referred to. The hollowing out of party structures over the long term has had a corrosive effect. The catastrophic position that the party has reached in Scotland, the broader failure to renew the party around the time of Blair and Brown's departure from office, Labour's vulnerability on the economy um, in the period since the financial crisis, which reflects the broader sense that Labour has struggled in the post-war period to find a convincing formula for economic management. And also the loss of intellectual capacity around the party, the sense of the alienation of the progressive intelligentsia, which of course is a big theme in the publications and deliberations of Political Quarterly. All of these factors suggest that one of the reasons why Labour has lost a sense of purpose is because of the problematic inheritance it was bequeathed by new Labour. But it's also to do, I think, with more recent efforts to try to articulate a revived purpose for Labour, which don't really appear to have succeeded. Between 2010 and 2015, of course, Ed Miliband was leader of the party, and he attempted in his period to forge um, a project known as One Nation Labour, that was based at least in part on the rejection of new Labour shibboleths such as supply-side Keynesianism and a turn towards policies that he characterised as pre-distribution, putting much greater emphasis on trying to reform and restructure the economy in order to deliver more egalitarian outcomes. But I think many, including some of Miliband's closest supporters, would accept that this effort did not really succeed. And John Crudus, who was Miliband's manifesto coordinator at the time, has argued that Miliband became too focused on pursuing a narrow 35% strategy, trying to squeak over the electoral finish line by appealing to a relatively narrow group of voters. And of course, ironically, Miliband ended up accepting the fiscal austerity that he initially, he initially critiqued on the part of the coalition government. Then, of course, we come to the Corbyn era. era. This was, in many respects, at least early on, I think fairly characterised as a period of creativity and rejuvenation on domestic policy. In key respects, and this is an argument I make in my contribution to the Political Quarterly Journal, it seemed as if the left was beginning to respond to the discrediting of the post-1994 consensus on economic policy. We were beginning to see the outpouring of ideas from think tanks and the academy. New thinkers were emerging on the scene. New propositions were being developed and put forward. Concrete ways of thinking about how Labour could reform the economy in order to achieve more egalitarian outcomes and in order to produce a fairer capitalism. But for reasons which um, Jeremy and also Lewis have written about in their own contributions to this political quarter quarterly collection, Corbynism never managed to achieve hegemony and dominance within the party, not least because, as they point out, it was seen as illegitimate by many figures in the Parliamentary Labour Party. So all of this means that by 2020, the context that Labour and Starmer inherited was one of deep crisis. There was an electoral crisis in that there was no clear strategy by which Labour could win a majority under the first-past-the-post system. The long-term loss of working class voters um, had caused great anxiety. The 2019 defeat had been its worst since 1935, and Labour had not won a national election since 2005. There was also an organisational crisis, a sense that the party was in deep internal conflict. Uh, there was a lack of resources, growing concerns about the financial base of the party. And of course, all of this was affirmed by 
the launch of an investigation by the Equality and Human Rights Commission into anti-Semitism and institutional racism in the party. And of course, um, after Corbyn's departure, we began to see the loss of members, which has only served to heighten the sense of organisational crisis around Labour. And finally, of course, there was an ideological crisis. I've already referred to this in the sense that there was no coherent account of what Labour was for that commanded or at least stood a chance of commanding a degree of consensus and agreement across the party. As such, then, I think we'd have to accept that Starmer inherited a party in 2020 which was divided and demoralised, and this has substantively framed the context for his leadership. The role of Labour opposition leader is tough in any circumstances, particularly over a four to five year parliament, as both Hugh Gates, still found in the 1950s, and Neil Kinnock found more recently in the 1980s and early 1990s. But despite this acknowledgement of the difficult context that Starmer inherited and the inherently tough role that being leader of the opposition is, many critics have argued that Starmer has played his hand badly in the period since he assumed the leadership. First, it's argued that Starmer has no clear project. His 10 pledges that were made during the leadership campaign promised some continuity with the Corbyn era. He, of course, committed to raise corporation tax and taxes on the wealthy, to abolish tuition fees to support the Green New Deal. He advocated no more illegal wars. He called for common ownership of mail, rail, energy and water. He promised to defend free movement after leaving the European Union. He promised that Labour would protect workers' rights, devolve power out of Westminster, revitalise UK democracy and provide effective opposition to the Conservatives. But these pledges in the end were a list rather than a serious political and governing project. And they were soon rendered out of date by the extraordinary circumstances created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Turning then to a second criticism, which relates to COVID, it can also be argued that Starmer's framing of the pandemic as another 1945 moment has not gained sufficient traction with voters. There is little evidence, at least so far, that voters' attitudes have shifted in a fundamentally more collectivist direction. Keir Starmer has attacked Tory austerity, but he hasn't yet clearly explained why 10 years of Conservative rule have left the UK vulnerable to the social and economic impact of the pandemic, and why the costs of COVID have been inflicted so unequally. And he needs to establish that narrative if he's to argue convincingly that the pandemic will usher in a new social democratic era in Britain. Third, critics believe that Starmer has failed to provide very much clarity on the key question of economic policy, which has historically been Labour's great vulnerability. Annalise Dodds has been replaced as shadow chancellor by Rachel Reeves. But what direction in economic policy is Labour now pursuing? Will Labour go into the next election pledging to spend more than the Conservatives? Is the current monetary policy framework sustainable given the UK's exposure to global economic risks post-Brexit? And does the party have a coherent alternative agenda to levelling up that can deal with some of the entrenched spatial and regional inequalities that have long afflicted the UK political economy? Final question that critics have raised about Starmer is, is he guilty of underestimating his opposition? Johnson's growing unpopularity has proved to be wishful thinking. The Tories have remained ruthless and focused on power. They don't fall easily into the trap of looking like cutters and small state enthusiasts, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic. And Labour appears to have lost ground in places like the north of England because the hatred of Thatcherism that for so long carried Labour's appeal seems to be losing resonance to some degree with younger voters. And John Johnson has had stories to tell about global Britain and levelling up, which however much we might decry their coherence, appears appear to have been relatively successful, and it's not clear what Labour has to say in response. So I've painted here a somewhat negative picture of the position that Labour finds itself in and the situation that Keir Starmer's leadership finds itself in 18 months after he assumed the leadership of the, of the party. I want to just finish my remarks by setting out what I think could and should be done um, and try to identify some ways in which Labour might find new sources of political energy in which it can start to develop a more positive and optimistic 
project for the future. I want to focus on second is about looking beyond the party and the third is about looking beyond the United Kingdom. So the first point is really about recapturing the intellectual dynamism that, have, that has existed previously in the Labour Party and, as I've argued, I think was present in the early years of the Corbyn project. In that time, a new generation of think tanks, new sources of ideas and new thinkers were emerging. And in my view, Starmer has to try to recapture that sense of energy, that sense of looking unashamedly in new ways at new questions and not being afraid to put new issues on the agenda are trying to address the problems of Britain through a distinctively left ideological position. That sense of dynamism has to be recaptured and Starmer has to try to energise the broader ecology of organisations and institutions on the left that can achieve that. There also has to be dialogue with political forces outside the Labour Party in forging this new policy programme. There has to be what David Marquand the long-standing historian of Britain and the centre-left has called a progressive alliance of the mind, a way by which the Labour Party can enter into a dialogue with other progressive forces, the Greens, the Liberal Democrats, other forces in politics outside party politics, in order to address the key issues of the time and begin to frame some credible policy responses. These dialogues have to focus on the critical issues for Britain in the future the future of the constitution and the cohesion of the union, the need for urgent action on climate change, the need to tackle in the insecurity that bedevils the post-pandemic gig economy and the insecurity of the new economy, which has had such adverse effects on younger generations. All of these questions have to be up, to, up for debate. And in my view, they can't be settled by the Labour Party having a debate that's internal to itself. As I say, it has to initiate dialogue with political forces outside the Labour Party in order to fashion a new programme and a new agenda. One minute. Finally, I think the Labour Party has to look beyond the United Kingdom. Do Germany and the United States, for example, provide inspiration for the British Labour Party? In both parties, forces traditionally associated with the left and right of the SPD and the Democrats have begun to collaborate. We know, of course, that in the United States, Biden and Sanders cooperated on the agenda that the Democrats fought in the last presidential election. And since then, there has been progress, not least in advancing a major infrastructure plan for the US economy that does appear to amount to significant progress. In Germany, it's too soon to tell what the result of the election will be later in September, but it seems likely that the SPD could well be a major player in the next German government. And the SPD has fought this election with Olaf Scholz as its figurehead, but with an emphasis on respect for workers, advocating a high minimum wage, less austere fiscal policies, but a real sense that the left and the right of the party are working together effectively. So in conclusion, I would just say this. The Labour cabinet minister, Richard Crossman, argued in 1951, the Labour Party has lost its way not only because it lacks a map of the new country it is crossing, but because it thinks maps are unnecessary for experienced travellers. Starmer's experience, in my view, shows that pragmatism and tactical manoeuvring are not sufficient. What Labour needs of it is to succeed as a, as a political force is a theory of politics, a clear purpose and coherent aims. And it's to those questions that Labour urgently needs to turn. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Patrick, for starting us off um, so brilliantly. Thank you. And um, Jeremy, are you ready to go next or would you like to be? No, I am. Yeah, I'm ready. And, and it's for about right. 13 minutes. I'll give you a one minute. Okay. okay well, thanks very much, uh, Patrick. That was brilliant. But um, so I'm going to say, um, does, I'm going to talk about this question. Does Starmer have a plan? And, to a large extent, I'm going to be reiterating an argument that I made. Well, actually, it's a continuation of an argument I made in my contribution to the political quarterly article, I mean, in the quarterly issue. So my article in the issue um, essentially addressed the question of why um, so, ma you know, so many um, 
members of the Parliamentary Labour Party were just not willing to be reconciled with the Corbyn project in any way, even after the 2017 result. You know, it was so unexpectedly uh, successful and was so, you know, you would have thought under normal, just under normal historical circumstances that there would have been some, you know, reflection on the fact that the 2017 election result was one that, according to all preconceptions, should have been completely just impossible. Uh, and there just wasn't really. Um, and ultimately, my argument there is, and um, you know, I think it's a pretty well evidenced argument, at least, and it fairly carefully made that, well, ultimately, you know, for for a large network of MPs, uh, councillors, uh, party bureaucrats, etc., there's just ultimately, you know, they perceived the Corbyn movement as a direct threat to their livelihoods, essentially. I think I think the you know the element of this equation which doesn't get talked about at all in generally in most of these discussions and in the press is you know there's about ten thousand labor councillors um in the country and a lot of them were very very worried that local that an influx of keen Corbyn supporting left wing members to their local parties was going to um was would see them deselected and replaced with with momentum candidates as councillors, and I think that's where ultimately I think that's where a lot of the pressure came from on the right wing of the PLPs, so led by people like Tom Watson, just really against all reason, or to some extent, to just to make to be just implacably hostile to, to Gorbin and, and the Gorbin project. Now, how this relates to the question of whether Keir Starmer has a plan is, as far as I can see, his plan is mere, it is nothing but a continuation of that. So there's really no, there's no consistency to his behaviour. There's been no consistency to the political actions he's taken other than the desire to just completely reverse the Corbyn project to, as far as possible, to actually you know, drive out of the party the people who joined you know, from 2015 onwards in order to support Corbyn or vote for Corbyn and to just completely really sort of remove any kind of elements from it. And I don't think there is a, any other plan. I, I don't see any evidence. And I think Patrick has given pretty good arguments. Obviously, he's, he's put the, uh, he, he's coming from you know, a slightly different perspective, but he's made a pretty compelling case that there isn't a project. And I think, but I think the reason there isn't a project to win, there isn't a project to form a Labour government is because there's another project which is really not compatible with the project of forming a Labour government at this moment in time. And that is the, pro the project of just eradicating Corbynism from the party completely. So I think you can go through a whole set of issues uh, that um, from the beginning of Starmer's leadership and, 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 and say, well, there's really no consistency to any of this other than just a determination, really, to sort of um, almost gratuitously to alienate the left and, and the left, and especially the sort of membership um, who were, who were pro-Corbyn. I think initially there's the issue of the 10 pledges. Uh, I mean, Patrick rightly points out that you can, you can make the claim that the 10 pledges have had to be in, suspended or rethought because of COVID. On the other hand, there's nothing really in the sort of centre-left or social democratic tradition that would lead you to the conclusion that any of those 10 pledges are somehow less appropriate post-COVID than they were pre-COVID. And Starmer's complete sort of flagrant, I mean, just quite gratuitous, uh, you know, um, breaking of you know, his just refute his breaking of all of his key promises on, on the constituted the platform he stood on is, as far as I can see, is completely unprecedented in the history of the party. Now, I don't I don't know of any example of a Labour leader being elected on on the um, on the basis of a program to uh, the um, on the basis of a program um, and just simply um, and just simply you know completely um, you know failing to implement any of them and doing something completely, you know, the reverse. Starmer's key pledge was to end factionalism and sort of bring unity to the party. Instead, you know, he, there's been no serious attempt at all to include um, sort of, you know, left-wing MPs who've all been sort of systematically removed from the shadow cabinet. There's been no attempt at all to, you know, at any kind of conciliation with, with the organised left in the party. There's been a really, I mean, almost farcically gratuitous you know, just recently set of prescriptions. I mean, there's been a set of prescriptions declared against organisations like Socialist Appeal, which just, you know, have no real political relevance to anything. There's a few dozen people who are, who are mostly very old. And it's just, you know, it just seems to be designed, you know, to explicitly sort of demoralise, explicitly to, to demoralise the left. Um, I think, you know, the way in which uh, all of this, any whenever this is brought out, you know, people who want to defend Starmer and his you know, behaviour, 
um, you know, we'll all constantly refer back this issue to the issue of, of the, the necessity of dealing with the anti-Semitism issue. Uh, I would simply contend that there's just been no, there are many ways that matter could have been handled and could have been dealt with, which wouldn't have involved this sort of gratuitous uh, alienation of the left. And um, you know, given that under Corbyn, you know, that get all, pretty much all, you know, all the EHRC, um, not the EHRC, the, the, the International um Defin you know, the, the International um, Holocaust Remembrance Society and definition of anti-Semitism uh, was kind of accepted. That the um, that the um, you know, as far as it was, as far as we can see, you know, there were good faith efforts were made to deal with the issue of anti-Semitism, and none of that has really been acknowledged. I and mean, it's, I don't think anybody, I don't think there can be any really. Um, I don't think there can be any objective analysis of the way in which the anti-Semitism issue has been handled by David Evans in particular, the chair of the party, which says that it hasn't been used to gratuitously to, to penalise the left. Um, and it certainly has, and we've seen at the Labour Party conference this year that, um, you know, people have, there's been attempts to exclude people, there's been attempts, there's been a really gratuitous, I keep using this word, but it seems the only one that's appropriate, um, treatment of young labour, um, partly on the grounds that the Palestinian solidarity movement wasn't going to be allowed to have any kind of representation at all at conference this year. And that's just, that's completely unprecedented. And it's completely contrary to any sort of um, real serious attempt to treat the issue of anti-Semitism and to separate it from you know, simple uh, support for the Israeli state policy. Um, so I just think that, and I think also, I think also the treatment of Corbyn himself has clearly just been, you know, unnecessary and provocative. There's no, there's just, it's, there's no precedent for it um, since um, the expulsion of Ramsay McDonald um, from the Labour Party uh, in, uh, it was 29 or 30. And I just don't think there's any, I don't think really, none of the key thing to say about all this is that none of it can really be justified on electoral grounds. There's just no real evidence that any of this like constitutes a coherent electoral project. Now, I think insofar as there is a kind of electoral theory underscoring all this, insofar as there is a kind of narrative going on in Starmer's office and, you know, in apparently, I think, you know, in, in his mind or the mind of the people advising him around, well, what would actually, um, you know, how how is it that any of this could lead to the formation of a Labour government? It does all seem to be grounded still in the arguments put forward by Claire Ainsley, who is one of the few people in his office, who, you know, who started out in his office a year ago, who's still there. Um, he was intellectually very close to Deborah Madison, who's been brought in as the sort of um, head of strategy. And that, is, and that is an analysis of British politics and Labour Party's relationship to it, which on the one hand focuses exclusively on very narrow sets of findings from focus groups, which use very narrowly defined sets of questions to elicit certain sets of responses from their audiences, um, and which focuses in very, very heavily on the loss of um, on the loss of the supposed loss of swing voters in um, traditional Labour voting constituencies in the so-called Red Wall. Um, but all of that is highly contentious. All of that, those, all of those claims, all of that analysis is highly tendentious. It doesn't take account of the extent to which um, labor, the, the voters who Labour have lost, you know, um, to, in the in very large proportion, you know, they are not just sort of generic work, quote unquote working class voters. They're voters in working class, in traditionally working class constituencies, most of whom who no longer work. They're retired. They've paid off their mortgages. Now, they're asset owners whose incomes are reliant on pensions invested on the stock market and on asset prices. In other words, in, in no kind of in no sort of on no sort of materialistic terms can they really be considered to be working class in any sort of meaningful sense. So if they're not working class voters, they are voters who once who were once working class, who have ceased to be working class, and historically going right back to the 1930s, going right back really to the beginnings of mass suffrage, voters who undergo that social transformation transition often switch their allegiance from Labour to the Conservatives. It's not a new phenomenon. It's a phenomenon, it's a phenomenon which we've been seeing in particularly large numbers over the past 15 years as the demographically the largest generation of the 20th century, the baby boomer generation, has entered retirement um, following you know, the, the biggest property bubble um, in British um, history. 
So under those circumstances, it's not at all surprising. It's entirely to be expected that those cohorts of voters would switch allegiance to the Conservatives. It's not true, for example, that in 2019, uh, working age voters in Red Wall constituencies mostly voted Conservatives. They didn't. I mean, a lot of them didn't vote at all, but there wasn't a large switch to uh, the Conservatives. So there's a narrative, I think there is a narrative, there is a kind of theory of change which is informing the Starmer project, but it's one which is incredibly weak. It's based on Ainsley's book, which is really just a little pamphlet. You know, it has very, a very weak evidence base and a very weak set of arguments, which is quite easily to knock down. And again, I think one has to conclude the only reason that narrative is being deployed is because it suits, it provides a justification for the project of just, as I've already described it, you know, Starmerism really being about just the kind of isolation of the left and the alienation of the left from the party. One minute, Jeremy. Okay. All of this, all, all of this, um, none of this is go, is working electorally, and it's not likely to work because it, it, you know the it would only it, this it would only work if. The core vote, um, the core Labour vote of the past of 10 to 15 years, that young young voters, metropolitan voters, could be relied upon to um, could be relied upon to uh, you know to remain loyal to Labour under these mm. circumstances, under circumstances where the person with whom many of them identified so strongly, Jeremy Corbyn, has been so kind of self evidently traduced by the leadership, and I'm afraid all the evidence is that isn't going to happen. Now, all of the evidence is. Uh, those those voters are going to either not vote or they're going to vote green or they'll vote for nationalist parties in Scotland and Wales. And it's just, it isn't a project. But ultimately, I don't think this really matters. I don't know whether it matters to start ultimately. If it's Jeremy, a choice you'll between, have to wrap up um, just let, so that we have time. Yeah, I'm, I am. I'm wrapping up. This is, this, is, this is the last thing. If it's a choice between permanent opposition but them keeping their jobs... Um, or a left-wing Labour government, they would rather they would rather choose the former, and I think that is what informs Starmer's project right now. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, just a reminder that if you do want to make a comment in chat, that's great. Um, but if you want to register a, an actual question that you want asked after Christine has um, finished talking, then if you could make that clear and can is addressed to all three or just one of the speakers. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jeremy and Christine. I just I need to apologise quickly before starting that I'm, I'm not too well at the moment, so um, apologies for A, probably not being very sparkling, um, and B, that I might have to leave the event a little bit early. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's my excuses out of the way. Um, so I'm hopefully going to sort of just pick up um, and develop a little bit some of the arguments um, or, or the themes that both Patrick and Jeremy talked about, really. Um, Patrick's uh, comments around the question of purpose, what is the Labour Party for? Um, and how can it recapture that sense of intellectual energy um, and how the sort of deep toxic factional warfare really um, that's going on in Gates and is, and is influencing the parameters of those debates and the party's kind of room, room for manoeuvre to say that if Starmer does have a plan, you know, as I think, both Patrick and Jeremy in different ways have, have suggested it's not one that's rooted in sort of deeply held ideological commitments and intellectual commitments um, about what is wrong with the country and what a sort of uh, social democratic or socialist response to that might look like. It's one that's rooted more in sort of uh, tactical claims about what it would take for Labour to win the next election and which voters it needs to target um, and also a sort of what I would say is a slingshot factional reaction to Corbynism um, and the desire above all else to kind of distance the party from Corbynism as much as possible. Um, so it, it's led by by those things rather than by uh, this sort of deeply held ideological commitment. news story wasn't there doing the rounds that Starmer had been having sessions 
sessions with Ed Miliband, I think it was, and Lud Falconer uh, to help him understand kind of what uh, what was Labour's critique of the economy and how it was different from the Tories. Um, <laughs> I kind of thought was a, if, I don't know if it was true, but if it's true, it's interesting, right? Because it suggests that there's there's a sort of um, cadre of, of leaders at, at the top of the Labour Party that don't have a kind of instinctual, um, deep, deep sort of account of political economy, really. Um, and interestingly, uh, I, so I've been reading the last couple of weeks, his namesake's book, Keir Hardy's From Serfdom to Socialism, and his account of, you know, the political economic analysis on which the Labour Party was founded. Um, and he says in it, the, the economic object of socialism is to make land and industrial capital common property. So he's very clear that property relations is where he kind of locates the problem um, and the democratization or common ownership of property as the solution. Um, and I think a lot of the, not, not all, but a lot of the intellectual ferment of the last few years that Patrick was talking about really has been an attempt by um, a sort of new generation of left thinkers uh, to kind of excavate and update and reconceptualize those sort of traditional socialist ideas, the socialist commitment to, to economic democracy and to democratic ownership, and to sort of update and refresh those ideas for a post-financial crisis era um, to understand kind of how they might apply um, to this sort of highly financialized economy that we have today. Um, and really, you know, with the sort of, uh, my generation grew, grew up under Blair and post kind of clause four, and I feel there's, they've almost needed to kind of rediscover <laughs> for themselves these ideas because we, for most of our lives, didn't even have a language to talk about things like ownership and power relations in the economy. And there's been an attempt to kind of revive um, those questions. Uh, but I think those people really sort of more the inheritors of the new left of the 60s and 70s, or in the sense of also in their solutions, um, having a sort of deeply held commitment to democracy and participation and kind of not just a desire to revive sort of bureaucratic statism of the post-war era, um, but an interest in more sort of um, diverse, pluralist, decentralised forms of um, public, common, cooperative, municipal ownership, um, and in kind of workplace democracy and, and, and questions about how we can empower people through our politics and through the economy. Um, and I think there is the potential in those ideas. I sort of argue in my political quarterly piece um, that in theory, at least, right, there's the potential for some of those ideas to unite the Labour Party um, and to, to offer a sort of powerful electoral platform. Uh, so I think some of the evidence <laughs> some, some uh, debate going on in the chat about the evidence on the popularity or otherwise of some of these ideas but um, the Labour Together report uh, that was done after the 2019 election um, I think was quite useful in bringing together some of the evidence and, and they did some of their own attitudinal research um, that some of these ideas both are popular and are popular with different sections of the of the electorate including some of those that Labour needs to win back um, and also there's often a surprising level of, of agreement, I think, at least in theory, on some of those ideas across factional divides. Right? So you see people like, you know, Jonathan Reynolds or Rachel Reeves um, have written in the past in favour of things like um, municipal ownership, cooperative ownership, um, in favour of some of the ideas uh, that were being developed around alternative models of ownership under Corbynism. Um, but <laughs> the rub, of course... Um, is that in practice it's almost impossible or has proved almost impossible um, to unify the party around any sort of such agenda. I, I think in large part just because the factional hostilities go so deep I think um, and and this kind of this there's been this strategic consensus that has emerged um, that the party needed to distance itself absolutely from anything that happened in the last five years and that that was the only route to restoring credibility. Um, and I think there's a huge number of babies being thrown out with the bathwater as a result of that, which really concerned me. Um, so I don't know how long I've got left, but I just want to say a bit about uh, both in kind of policy or intellectual terms and in, elect and in electoral terms. Um, what that means and what that looks like in terms of, of Starmer's current strategy um, and, and some of the pitfalls. Um, and I think part of the problem is that because of this sort of factional hostility, um, there's been such a breakdown in communication actually between the different wings of the party and such a total absence of dialogue that I think there's often not a very clear understanding when the party's trying to distance itself from 
the last five years of, of what it's really trying to distance itself from. Um, because I think what's often not understood is that um, both at an intellectual level, you know, in terms of, you know, Patrick was talking about these kind of new think tanks and, and resurgence of thinking around the Labour Party, um, and at a sort of more mass level in terms of people really of my generation and younger who were infused um, by Labour under Corbynism, um, Labour kind of became a magnet for a lot of people and a lot of energy and a lot of new thinking, um, you know, among many people who maybe weren't particularly committed strongly to that particular faction of the Labour Party or even to the Labour Party at all. So the problem that Starmer has now, I think, even now that he's kind of recognised and has started talking about um, having a vision and he's instigated this policy review, is that um, the assumption seems to be that, that that these ideas need to come from somewhere new. They can't come from anywhere that's associated with the last five years, that they're out there somewhere, um, you know, that the wheel needs to be reinvented. Um, but I genuinely think it's, it's quite hard to find any serious new left thinking that's happened really over the last 10 years that isn't in some way tainted by association with Corbynism because, um, you know, everyone that I know in the think tank world, in the in the policy world that was kind of doing that sort of thinking obviously wanted to kind of try and influence Corbyn's Labour because it seemed like, you know, the best shot that they'd seen in their lifetimes at, at getting a hearing and at progressive change. Um, so I think that that really kind of narrows their range of options if they're trying to, to think about developing a political project and put forward a story. Um, I really struggle to see where that story is going to come from. Um, and I think that you see some attempts being made from the sort of blue Labour faction um, and, you know, John Crudis's new book, Dig The Dignity of Labour, to try and offer a sort of alternative. But I think that in itself, it I think is a real symptom of this, this breakdown of communication um, and I say that with the greatest of respect for John, because I think he is one of the, you know, Patrick talks about the, the lack of intellectual capital around the party, like John is one of the, the really serious thinkers um, in the Labour Party and someone that I've had a really good relationship with in the past and have a huge amount of time for. Um, and when I had started, when I was at the New Economics Foundation, to kind of think about some of these ideas around ownership, um, you know, uh, ownership relations in the economy and democratising ownership, um, John seemed really interested in them at events that we were both at. I've not spoken to John in five years, right, in six years, and I don't think that's a coincidence, and nor do I think it's a coincidence that his book um, doesn't really engage with those arguments at all. Um, it, it sort of constructs this straw man of Corbynism as, as driven by this sort of post-work politics uh, against which, you know, we have to reassert the importance of the dignity of labour and the politics of work. And I agree with everything he puts forward in propositional terms, and I don't think it's anything that most people on the left of the party would disagree with. Um, but I think it kind of needs to be augmented with, with more of an analysis of, well, what are the political economic drivers? You know, what, what are the reasons why we don't have good work at the moment, right, in terms of power relations in the economy, ownership relations in the economy? Um, and I think there's a reason at the moment why um, those issues aren't being considered by this kind of wing of the party that does seem to, to kind of have to some degree an influence on the leadership because everything, you know, every intellectual debate has become kind of bent and distorted around these kind of increasingly toxic factional hostilities and the need to kind of construct a factional other or a factional enemy against which to kind of make your arguments. Um, and it's kind of really sad to see. And I, you know, I hope that, as Patrick is suggesting, there is a way that Labour can uh, can find a way to rediscover the ability to have dialogue. I hope that, you know, um, people like me and John can kind of sit in a room and actually discover that we have a lot of common ground. But, uh, you know, the dynamics that Jeremy was talking about in terms of the, the just kind of, um, yeah, uh, complete uh, desire to excommunicate the left, I think uh, make that very difficult. It, I find it hard to kind of see with things kind of as, as toxic as they are in the Labour Party at the moment, um, what, what the way back is to, to enable that kind of dialogue to take place again. But I think that's what needs to take place if the party is going to unite around a coherent vision that can win. Um, I'm assuming I'm probably nearly out of time, but I want to say a little bit just as well. And it's already been alluded to by the other speakers about how this plays out in electoral terms as well. Because We've got yeah, two minutes, Christine. Two minutes, so great. Got, Hopefully that time. should be enough, yeah. Um, so I think it's not just the ideas around Corbynism that, that are... Um, that it's, it's being assumed need to be jettisoned. It's the people, you know, as Jeremy said, to a large extent. And I think what's often not understood 
is that what that really means is telling an entire generation, anyone younger than me who's broadly on the left, that they're not welcome in British politics anymore. Like maybe that sounds like an exaggeration, but I genuinely worry about this because I think there were a lot of sort of circular arguments made about who these people were that joined Corbyn's Labour um, that needed to be made in order to delegitimize them and, and kind of um, you know denigrate them really but because it was a, it was an astonishing achievement in a way that you know under Corbyn Labour became the largest mass party in Europe and you know I think it's important to try and understand why that was I spent most of my youth with older people in politics wringing their hands about why were young people so apathetic? Why didn't they vote? That was that was the trope at the time, right? And then over the last five years, it feels a bit like young people got involved in politics and it turned out they were quite radical and everyone went, oh gosh, no, not like that. Please get back in the bin. Um, and that's kind of what uh, what it feels like is is happening now, particularly kind of, I, I talk in my, in my PQ essay about some of the rows that happened in the early stages of the pandemic over things like rent freezes, you know, um, and help for private renters who were struggling under COVID, which is sort of emblematic, I think, of this growing sort of political divide between young, um, precarious renters who are kind of increasingly being dismissed as not important because they're not truly working class because they've got degrees and they're on the left, <laughs> this seems to be, the, or, or they may work in kind of in service jobs um, or white collar jobs. Uh, these sort of urban millennials um, and older um, blue collar voters who you know maybe live in these red world, red rural towns um, as Jeremy said more likely to be retired more likely to be homeowners you know there's a whole load of really complicated dynamics that need to be unpacked and better understood about how class composition is changing in this country um, which I don't think are very well served by these sort of simplistic attempts to pit these kind of young urban millennials against kind of working class red wall voters. And my worry is that, you know, we're in a country where already trust in democracy is, is catastrophically low. There's, there's a lot of evidence that shows that, right? Um, and, you know, the, the older generation who voted for Brexit, actually, partly this was driven by a kind of lack of trust in democracy and um, somehow Boris Johnson managed to uh, if you could position himself as an alternative yeah. to this corrupt political establishment. Um, and so if you've got that on the one hand and, you know, the coming scandal and all the rest of it, you know, uh, a government that, that is showing politi politicians can't be trusted. And then you've got this younger generation who are basically receiving the message from the leader of the opposition that they're not welcome in politics anymore. I genuinely worry that that's quite a combustible combination for the future of our democracy. So I think there's more at stake here, basically, than the factional politics of the Labour Party. And uh, and that's often forgotten when we talk about these things. And I'll leave it there. Sorry. Thank you.